Welcome insiders, Brian Reese here coming at you live from Austin, Texas. And as you can see, I'm not alone today. Thank God I got my brother, uh, coach Daryl McDonald, who I'm going to get to in a minute. But I'm really, really excited about this, y'all. And here's why I'm excited. This is a brand new series we are launching across the VA Claims Insider media platforms. And it's called Ask the VA Raider. How awesome is it that you can actually hear from somebody who spent six plus years years in the title of what's called RVSR at the VA. Okay, that's a rating veteran service representative. This man reviewed and rated claims for a very long time, okay, for the VA. So he was a VA employee. And the other thing that is so amazing about this man is the fact that he was so good as a rater, they called on him to teach, train, and equip other raiders in the system they used to fly him around teaching other raiders how to be a raider and guess what what a blessing it is to be able to share life with this man and share the stage with him d mac i love you brother welcome to the show thank you for that b um yeah welcome everybody uh just just a little about me to get started um i did serve in the marine corps um for about four years i got out after the first gulf war uh, after a short stint of being a high school teacher and a head football coach, I did go to work for the VA. I worked for the VA for 11 years, six and a half that I spent as a rating specialist. And then I was also in the management team at the local regional office. So I worked the, the system from beginning to end. Um, I was a VSR to start with, then I was an RVSR, and then I, I did a lot of post-development authorization and um, adjudication also. That is so awesome. Thank you, brother. I, I'm, it is an absolute honor uh, and a pleasure to be here. And, and look, we want to jump right into this. So here is what we're talking about today, okay? Ask the VA Raider, you could be missing out on this gateway VA claim, okay? So stay tuned. What the heck is this gateway VA claim? DMAC, help us. Well, to be honest with you, there's a lot of uh, there. There could be potentially a lot of gateway claims, especially now with the PACT Act and the presumptive conditions. So um, having those claims, but a gateway claim is something that's going to get you started in the system, um, especially if you've never filed a claim before. Uh, and the most common, the most common and easiest gateway claim would be tinnitus. Um, you know, tinnitus. The VA has a, a probability of exposure list that they put out. And if you're one of those people who, you know, 11 Bravo for the Army, 0311, 0331 for the Marine Corps, um, anybody that was exposed to a lot of noise while in the service um, definitely qualifies for that that tinnitus claim if if they have tinnitus. Right? Absolutely. And what's the rating for tinnitus? Uh, it's 10 percent, but it's a start in the system. And once you get your system, go get get started in the system and get your name in the system and they've they've requested your records you, they've got your personnel file um you know then you're you start getting that 10 percent. then it leads to other claims from there um absolutely I agree. yeah what one do you the, go ahead oh, go ahead go ahead dmac well i was gonna say one of the biggest things with tinnitus tinnitus is the only claim that the va will let a veteran self-diagnose because it's purely subjective right so so having that um having the tinnitus and being able to speak to when you were exposed to noise, um, when you first started, when you first noticed your your tinnitus, and the impact that it's had on your life is is very important as part of that claim. I agree. And what would you say? You know, we get a lot of vets, DMAC, who are following along, and they probably don't have very good medical records. Okay, they they might not even have much of anything from service. Would you recommend that you can go for a tinnitus claim if if you're really lacking medical evidence? Is that where you're going here? Yeah, you can potentially go for that claim. That's one of those claims that now, obviously, with any claim, the more medical evidence you have, the stronger the claim is. Um, but if you have that DD-214 that shows that you had an MOS that 
that potentially exposed you to a lot of noise working on the flight line, um, working with artillery, you know, and I've, I've mentioned that the, the ground pounders, you know, the grunts and the, and the 0311s, the 11 Bravos. If you have that DD-214 showing that you had the potential for our highly probable noise exposure, um, you know, all you really need is to have that tinnitus and be able to write a statement to that tinnitus. Absolutely. When, so when you say a statement, are you talking like a, a personal statement in support of a claim that the veteran writes? Yes, on the 21-4138. Yeah, the, the personal Beautiful. statement. Beautiful. Okay. So let's, let's recap this quick far quick uh, y'all with where we are right now. So tinnitus is probably the number one gateway claim we call them, although there, there are other gateway claims, especially now that the PACT Act is around, which we'll get to here in a little bit. But if you've never filed a VA claim before and you don't have very much medical evidence filing a claim for tinnitus, the ringing in your ear, assuming you have it, okay, don't, don't file a claim if you don't have it, but assuming you have it, this is an easy one to get approved at 10%, okay? Now, the other thing that he, DMAC is sharing with us and why we call it a gateway claim is there's a whole bunch of other high value claims that can be connected secondary to tinnitus once that condition is service connected. DMAC, share with us, you know, your role as a coach now and then your role as a raider. What are some secondary claim strategies once somebody has tinnitus service connected? Well, if you're looking at secondary, one of the big ones is mental health. Tinnitus can definitely have an impact on your mental health, whether it's not allowing you to sleep at night, waking you up during the nighttime, not being able to go back to sleep. You know, that can cause some irritability you know, which can cause relationship issues. So it just kind of snowballs into the mental health claim. Um, one of the one of the other um, claims that was hugely secondary was was acceptable as a secondary claim was was migraine secondary to tinnitus. Um, the VA recently has been kind of um, taking a closer look at those claims. So usually if you can get the mental health and then do the migraine secondary to the mental health and the tinnitus, it just kind of makes it a stronger claim. Interesting. So you're saying you would go, let's say you've got depression, you know, anxiety, or even insomnia or insomnia as a symptom, you could maybe go depression and anxiety secondary to tinnitus, and you could also go migraine secondary to tinnitus through the mental health connection. Right, right. What I would do is I would go the mental health connection first and then do the migraine secondary to the mental health and the tinnitus. It's just a stronger claim. Anytime you can match up your condition with with a couple of service connected conditions and, and you have the medical evidence to support it, it just makes a stronger claim. Absolutely. How important is a nexus letter for a secondary claim, in your opinion? Uh, it's extremely important. You do have to have that link. Um, you know, if you're service connected for tinnitus, you're still going to need that link, linking your mental health to your tinnitus. You're not going to have much success in the claim without it. Um, so building that medical evidence and then getting that nexus of that link, linking it, um, any secondary claim you have, that nexus is very important. Absolutely. One one thing I wanted to to share, and this was something that I've learned. And by the way, guys, like I learned so much from from people like Daryl, DMAC on our team and our coaches, right? I mean, we're constantly learning from each other. It's not, you know, I'm not just out here barking orders. I mean, they're all boots on the ground serving veterans every day, all day. They're seeing things and trends of what's happening at the VA in real time. And I'm learning from them. And so, you know, that the, that's the part, in my opinion, that makes us, I mean, I think that's what makes our company amazing is we're getting real time from the you know boots on the ground what's happening at the va in real time and that information is then being shared across the organization and it may tweak or change some of the tactics of what we're teaching veterans in our program as we're learning these things um in real time and so man i i so appreciate it and, and this was one i remember we were talking about this very issue and i'm like holy crap that makes a lot of sense i didn't think about it that way um, one other thing that 
you know, I wanted to talk about regarding secondary claims and, you know, a lot of vets don't even know what a secondary claim is. They don't understand what, you know, principles of like causal effect or aggravation. What are some of the things that you looked for as a Raider? So put, put your VA employee hat on, you're an RVSR and a claim comes in and somebody filed a secondary claim. What, what are you looking for specifically as the Raider? You know, the first thing you need to do is look at anatomy and physiology. So, um, and I'll give you an example. So if somebody had bad feet while they were in service, their service connected for PES planus, plantar fasciitis, something like that, um, knowing that, that the physiology of that condition, you're going to change your gait. You're going to change the way you walk. So eventually it could, could impact your knees, could impact your hips, could impact your back. So just knowing the anatomy and physiology of a condition and how that condition can affect other body parts and then looking for the medical evidence, you know, it's not really enough saying, well, I've got bad feet, so I've got bad knees. Um, have a diagnosis, go see a doctor, get a diagnosis for your knees and then build that medical evidence for your knees, as well as a nexus letter linking your knees to your feet. Um, there's really a process to the whole thing, right? So um, in order to get an examination from the VA, you would have to have that link. You would have to draw that link and, and provide that nexus saying, yeah, you know, it's, it's likely that that would happen. And then the VA will go out and they'll request their own opinion um, as to whether it's at least as likely as not that that condition could cause the other condition. Um, and most of the time, unless it was a pre-existing condition, it's going to get service connected as a secondary to a primary. Yep. Fascinating. And I'm just curious, you know, one of the things that I've heard as part of the problem, and by the way, I'm not, I'm not here faulting any VSR or RVSR. If you're hearing us talk right now, thank you. You've got a big job. You've got a really, really important job. You're under the gun, you know, dang, your keystrokes are being tracked. You've got quotas to meet every single day. You know, you're trying to review and rate claims. You're trying to help veterans. You know, and one of the things that we hear a lot, DMAC, is, you know, well, the VA intentionally denies claims. You know, the, the Raiders are intentionally trying to deny veterans uh, their benefits. What, what would you say to that having been there? Realistically, that, that's just false. It, it really is. Um, you know, claim, claim grants or denials are based around medical evidence. So if you have the medical evidence to substantiate your claim and, and it's going to get granted, all right? Um, most over 50% of VA employees are veterans themselves. Um, and I can tell you the office that I worked at was probably closer to 70%. But, um, you know, when it comes to rating claims, you're, you're required to follow law, 38 CFR M21-1MR. You're required to follow laws. And sometimes those laws change. Um, but for the most part, you're required to follow those laws. And if, as long as that claim falls within those laws, that's where that's where the service connection happens. Um, the VA actually has a, a motto, per se, the Raiders do anyway. It says, grant if you can, deny if you must. So they're not looking mm -hmm. to just deny you. You know, if, if it were up to Raiders, I think most Raiders would, would rather grant a condition than deny a condition. But because those laws are in place, they can't just arbitrarily start granting claims, right? So it's not on the rating specialists. It's not on the, the VA themselves. It's on the laws that are out there. Interesting. Here's what I'm hearing, y'all. Help us help you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, and I'm just even thinking like, I'm just imagining me being a VA rater or me being in those shoes. Like, you know, again, you're just trying to, review the evidence, you're trying to make the best decision you can with the evidence you have. But if you don't have the evidence, y'all, if you're submitting claims without medical evidence or without a nexus to show a connection, guess what? The the, the Raider has to deny you. Mm -hmm. they, they have to deny you. And, and I'm sure you know, DMAC, I'm sure you, I'm sure you loved denying people benefits, right? When you're like, you, you probably saw this stuff come through and you're shaking your head like, oh, I wish I could call this guy or gal and tell them how they need to fix this. That was one of the biggest frustrations was having to deny somebody when, when the evidence was just right there 
just right there, if they would have submitted one more document or made one more statement, then it would have been a grant. And you're right. I mean, it, it does get frustrating for, for rating specialists. Um, it's, it's a, it's a battle. Um, it was one of the biggest, you know, honestly, I, I used to take it home with me at night and it would, it would, yeah. it would haunt me till the next day, but you know, Raiders are under tight, they're under tight, tight guidelines. So they've got to make a production. They've got to make a quality. So when that happens, errors are going to be made. Right. And it's not an intentional error. It's a human error. It, it just happens, which is unfortunate. And now with the AMA, the, uh, the uh, appeals management act, there are ways to correct that, but yeah, it's, it's uh when a Raider gets that error returned back to them, it's, it's, it's crushing. It really is. And, and they learn from it and they try to do better the next time. Wow. Fascinating y'all. Again, you're, you're hearing it directly from a man who was not only, you know, the frontline representative is a VSR. Now you got a guy who's spent six and a half years as an actual Raider. Okay. And then he was teaching, training, equipping other Raiders. All right. This, this guy's been there, done that. Uh, and seen it from all sides. And, and a couple things that I'm even just picking out hearing this, and, and you hear me say this all the time, medical evidence wins or loses claims, period. Okay. And, and what I heard here just totally validates that statement. And, you know, look, vets, here's the other thing I, I want to address. The VA knows, the Raiders know, the VSRs know that you probably didn't go to the doctor enough on active duty. Okay. It's, it's well known that, you know, you didn't want to be that guy or gal. You didn't go into the V, you know, you didn't go in on active duty for, for treatment when you should have, you might not have been seen for mental health because you were worried about your security clearance or your unit finding out these things are known. Okay. But remember you have to help them help you. And so if you didn't have the proper medical evidence from your time on active duty, you need to supplement that with new medical evidence. Okay. Maybe your, maybe your continuity of care, you're seeking treatment at the VA, right? You're in mental health therapy and, and you're seeing somebody, maybe you're taking medications or you aren't, but you're, you're being seen for the condition. You're in therapy. You got a diagnosis. Okay. Maybe your physical problems, you're now being seen, whether it's at the VA or a private doctor, a, a key core fundamental principle here is continuity of care. And what did you do from the time you left active duty to where you are today? And the more you can fill in those gaps with medical evidence, the better off you are going to be. Absolutely. Absolutely. And and just kind of an example of that, um, you know, we have a lot of people that come in airborne or have a parachute badge mm -hmm. or, or have made jumps um, from an airplane or a helicopter or whatever it may be. Um, the VA does recognize that having that badge there's going to be some issues with your feet, with your knees, back, potentially back, neck later on in life. But if you haven't received any care for those conditions since you got out of service, it's really hard to draw that link saying that, you know, I got out of service 20 years ago. I've got bad knees today. It's really hard to say that something else didn't happen over those 20 years that could have potentially led to the bad knees. So you're absolutely right. Continuity of care is huge. Yeah, it's so big, y'all. And and DMAC, one of the things I see a lot in the comments of, you know, the material we put out is, you know, well, I already have a 30% rating for PTSD, you know, should I keep going to therapy? You know, should I keep taking my meds? You know, they help me, but I'm worried my employer's going to find out or, you know, does the VA really care if I'm still, you know, receiving treatment? And it's like, you know, I'm curious your perspective on this. And what I usually tell people is, look, like the goal here is to get better. It, it's not to get worse. It's, it's not to have you, you know, putting up this facade of I'm worried about going to therapy because the VA might reduce my rating like that. I mean, to me, it's just that doesn't make any sense to me at all. No, doesn't to me either. And, and be honest with you, at 30%, you're grossly underrated for a mental health condition anyway, with the average being a 70% rating. But 
the only way i mean build that build that medical evidence go go get seen if you know we talk about 22 a day and if you're not getting seen you know it's 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 hard to know what's going on with somebody if they're not getting seen and they're not talking to somebody so myself i'm 100% for a mental health condition and i absolutely get seen um and take medication for it. So mm -hmm. it's, it's important that you get seen, no matter what your condition is, um, get seen for it. it it's, you know, it's, it's not going to get better on its own. It's, it's, you build that medical evidence and get that treatment. I agree. And, and again, look, I'll, I'll just share something that I do and it's not just for the sake of getting medical evidence. It's also so that I get my prescriptions on time. Okay. I, I use my healthy vet which is a VA system you should have. I log in there. I can send secure messages to my psychologist, my psychiatrist. I can send a message to my primary care team if I need more medications or refills. I can also reorder so I can refill my own prescriptions on my healthy vet. And those things are then automatically shipped to me. Well, guess what? When you're communicating over secure messenger with your VA care team and they're communicating back, guess what mysteriously ends up in your VA medical records and your treatment notes, okay? Your lab results, those go in your records. Your physical results, they go in your records. Every time you show up to see your primary care doctor and they take you through the depression screen, they ask you, how are you feeling? How are you sleeping on a scale of blah, blah, blah? What's your anger like? What's, they ask you the depression screen. All of that is medical evidence that goes in your record, okay? So again, our advice, and I, I mean, I heard DMAC validate it, go to your medical appointments, get help. We're trying to help y'all get better, okay? Don't worry about the VA taking your rating. Worry about your health as a human being and how you are as a father, you know, a, a, a spouse, a wife, a mother, whatever. We want you to get better. That's part of the life change. Let's talk. I want to switch gears just a little bit, DMAC. Yeah. Um, and I want to talk about strategy. So like VA claims strategy. I see some vets in these other Facebook groups, you know, they're like, I filed a claim for, and they list like 27 conditions that they filed a claim for. And they're like, you know, it's been 60 days and I haven't heard anything from the VA. And I sort of just shake my head. What <laughs> talk me through some of the strategy here of what should a veteran do here? Well, first I want to tell you a little story. So when I was reading I did have a veteran submit a claim. It was 847 contentions. <laughs> they essentially went through the the they went through the uh, medical dictionary and just started listing everything. Right. So that's <laughs> takes a while. <laughs> takes a while. So realistically, when you submit a claim that's got 26 contentions on it, to be honest with you, if you submit a claim by contentions, I mean issues. Um, the VA calls them contentions. So if, if you submit a claim that's got five or six on there, um, it's going to take longer because 38 CFR 3.159, duty to assist, they have to go after any and all medical records or any information to assist you in validating that claim. So when you're submitting five or six things at a time, it's going to take longer because the, the first off, the VSR has to go through everything to make sure you have those conditions even, either in your service treatment records and your service personnel file, they've got to make sure that the conditions are going to be rateable. Then it's going to take a little bit for the, the rating specialist if you have to go to multiple exams. So those exams get put out. Now exams are spread apart. They're not all in one day. Um, so if you simplify that and you do a couple of issues at a time, raters love to pick up those one or two issue claims, rate those things, get them off their desk, get their production points, um, usually the quality is way up there on those because it's only one or two issues. So those get worked quicker. They get worked a lot faster. Um, the multiple issue claims or the multiple contention claims, those usually sit on a desk or sit in a, in a, the VBMS system. 
those usually sit there for a little while until, you know, a rating specialist is on overtime, they'll work them on overtime. Um, you know, if they're working weekends, they're working on a weekend, but they, they go through and they try to get their production points first. So those, those smaller claims get worked a lot quicker. You get your results back a lot quicker and, um, you roll on to the next claim from there. Man, that's powerful. And like, just hearing it from you again, totally validates y'all ever heard me say less is more. <laughs> okay. Y'all heard me say more is not more when it comes to the VA disability system. That is a truth bomb, like times a thousand here, y'all. If you file a single disability claim and I'll just call them conditions, you call them contentions. Let's say I've got, you know, 30 conditions I've filed for sleep apnea, PTSD, flat feet, blah, 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 knees, back, shoulder, ain't whatever. Okay. That claim is going to take forever to adjudicate and, and think about why that is, okay? The, the VSR, they're going to be looking, they got to order C&P exams probably for all of those conditions. Well, you're talking about different specialties, right? Mental health is going to go to, to a C&P examiner. Your physical conditions are going to go to an examiner. If there's any specialty claims, they might go to a different examiner. And so, you know, like, those claims are going to take forever, but then hearing you DMAX share why that is like, Hey, I get my production points. I love this one. I can, I could rate this thing as soon as it gets to my desk, as long as the medical evidence is there. That is why we preach your VA claim strategy is very important. Okay. The tactics don't matter if you haven't nailed your strategy. And that's one of the things that our coaches do at VA Claims Insider. And, and DMAC, I got a feeling we're going to start getting some personal requests of, uh, you know, hey, I'm, I'm interested in joining the elite program, but I want that guy as my coach. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll uh, please bear with us. We have other amazing teammates, too. And Daryl can't serve everybody, but uh, but we'll try. And, you know, Brian, honestly, the the beautiful thing about this company is is my knowledge the coaches you know my knowledge the coaches have it I learn things from coaches every day also so it's not like I'm the anomaly here it's it's company-wide all the coaches are pretty pretty well handling business <laughs> we'll have to edit that but <laughs> all the coaches are doing their job man and it's awesome it's awesome to watch it's awesome it, it is it's it's been such a blessing to see this organization grow and to see how much that we care. And I mean, y'all we're, we're sharing every day, our successes and our failures, and we're sharing the stories of life change of the things that are happening. And, and you know what, there's, there's one thing that happens around here that never, ever, ever gets old. And that is hearing from a fellow veteran that they won their claim, they increased their rating, and their life has been changed forever. That, that, it, that never gets old. And, and DMAC, like when we're in our communication channels and people are posting, you know, the reviews, and I just talked to this veteran, they were crying, like 30 years, this guy got denied, he finally got his PTSD claim approved, like, I... I have never read a single review and, and I've read thousands. I've talked to thousands of veterans. It never gets old. It really doesn't. And you know, we celebrate with the veterans and we celebrate with our teammates here too. You know, it goes in the channel. We got a win today or, you know, our veteran got a win today, 60 to 70%, whatever it is, it's, it's celebrated across the board. And it's, it's, uh, it, it, you know, doing this job is truly a calling. It is so satisfying when veterans get their get their increases that they truly deserve, legally, morally, and ethically deserve. Um, yeah, and and those ones that have been waiting forever. You know, my specialty. I love working with Vietnam veterans. Um, probably the most underserved, underrated um, veterans that are out there right now. Um, I love working with them because they're so appreciative of everything. And um, man, it's just it's just great hearing that guy got out in '69. I've been fighting the VA ever since. I just got to 100%. 
Um, I love you guys. You guys are awesome. <laughs> Never gets old. I agree. And speaking of, speaking of Vietnam, I remember a guy that this was in our early days and I ended up with in the phone with this guy. And and I could tell, I mean, this, this individual, you know, you could tell this guy was high caliber, but he was holding something back. And, and I just said, you know, Hey, can you share more about your, your story? You know, tell me more about you. And uh, he was a brigadier general in Vietnam and he was sharing, you know, the things that he did and the men that he led and, and how many of his troops didn't come home uh, and what it was like to come home to a country that hated them, spat on them for the fact that they, you know, were over there. Um, man, we just like, we just did life together on this call. And, and I mean, we're both in tears. He's telling me these stories and he's telling me about what happened to his life when he got home. You know, he's been married a couple of times, divorced a couple of times, estranged from his kids. You know, he's, he's drinking too much. He's abusing drugs. I mean, he's, sh he's sharing the story of the dang year we all have. And uh, he's just like, you know, what do you think I should do? And I'm like, oh, man, like, uh, here's what we're going to do. Like, we're going to go right after the mental health. By the way, I'm, I've already Googled the closest VA clinic to you. Like, as soon as we're done here, you're going to pick up the phone. You're going to call mental health. You're going to get an appointment. You are going to go in and get seen. <laughs> like, I mean, again, we're not just helping you with your disability claim. This is comprehensive life change, y'all. And that's that's what you're going to get when you work with us. And, and I think that's what makes us different. Um, there's a lot of things that make us different than other companies out there. But I think how much we care about human beings and about helping veterans become the best versions of themselves and helping them celebrate life change. I, I would put us up against anybody. I really would. And I, I think you said it best before when you said beyond the claim. Yeah. Because veterans, veterans to us aren't just the claim. There's so much more behind it. We build relationships. We build friendships. Um, you know, our coaches go out and they see some of these, some of these veterans, they, they meet them, you know, they run into them, they have conversations with them. It's not just about um, getting a claim submitted. It's about everything. It's about the total veteran life. Yeah. And the other, you know, look, I'm, I'm not going to speak ill about our competitors, but I know how they work. They're, they're claim shops. They're, they're going to try to pour as many claims into the funnel as possible as fast as possible using whatever evidence they have at their disposal. And are they building relationships with veterans? Are they helping veterans improve their lives, not just get their disability claim in? What is this really about for them? And, and that's what I would ask you to think about before you select to work with somebody. Um, just think about that. Think about who you want leading you through the maze of VA claims, your VA claim success journey. And then I want you to start thinking about who's going to welcome me home. Who's going to call me by my first name. Who's going to text me. Who's going to take a call with me when I'm suicidal or, or I'm having major mental health issues. Who's going to talk to me when I lose my job. Who's going to talk to me when things are bad at home. Okay. Who's going to talk to me when I don't want to go to the VA because I don't trust them? Who's going to talk to me when things get really hard and my mental health is spiraling downhill? Okay. We will. Our coaches will. And, and he's not kidding. The relationships we build with you is, I think, the most satisfying part of what we do. And seeing a veteran's life not just be changed financially, but comprehensive. And, and I'm just going to share an example. Okay. We helped a veteran save his house during COVID. Okay. Single dad, got a little girl. He say his VA rating increased. He was able to save his house and make his mortgage payments. Okay. For the first time, he finally went in and got seen for mental health treatment. So he fixed that. What's next? He wanted to lose 30 pounds. So we started talking about a fitness program. And I just shared with him briefly some of the stuff that I'm doing. And by the way, I'm not a fitness guru, but I just started sharing some of the things. Okay. So he gets himself on a fitness plan. 
He starts thinking about how do I be a better father? Hey, what books do you have that can teach me how to be a better father because I'm by myself? How do I do that? Right? And he started, he started working on himself. Guess what, y'all? The inner game determines the outer game. Okay? What's in here and what's in here determines all of this. And I can virtually guarantee you your life is not going to change until you start working on this and you start working on this. Okay. And again, that's, that's what we're teaching. Okay. Before we wrap up, I know we could just, we did, we, I'm getting all, I'm getting all jacked up. You've been stuff that preaching, baby preach. I'm going to start preaching. Um, DMAC, before we go and leave today's episode, right? Ask the VA Raider. Let's talk about the gateway claim you might be missing. We talked about how it can be directed, you know, service connected, direct service connection. We talked about all the secondary claims that can then come off of it. We talked about a whole a bunch of other topics, but I want to revisit the last thing because we also, you also mentioned the PACT Act, which is, which is big right now. The PACT Act, it's hard to say. Um, how is the PACT act a gateway claim uh and what would you recommend like what evidence does a veteran need to submit for pact act um well it all depends on on which portion of the pact act you're talking about so if you're talking about burn pits you're going to want to submit something that shows and and dd 214 basically covers a lot of it so whether you were in southwest asia you have the southwest asia service medal the iraqi campaign medal the afghanistan campaign medal um, you know, you got Vietnam service. There's, there's, there are different conditions that the PACT Act covers. And on the PACT Act, just a quick note on that. If you have something that is a presumptive condition, make sure you get your intent to file in by August 9th. Mm -hmm. Okay. That way you can be back paid for a year. But on the PACT Act, just establishing that claim, if it's, if it's burn pit and you have evidence of sinusitis, rhinitis, one of those conditions, that can be a gateway claim because that can lead to other conditions, um, potentially to a sleep apnea claim. You know, you're talking respiratory to respiratory. Mm -hmm. So it can be a gateway claim in that manner where you get it submitted, you get service connected for it, even at 0%, you're still in the system, you're still moving through the system, your information is there. Now, every claim after that is going to go just a little bit quicker, but you can tie those secondary conditions also. Sinusitis, you can have headaches, right? You can get headaches, for sinus headaches. Um, then you can go the mental health route from there, but there's, there's, a just take a look at, at the PACT Act stuff, but I also want people to remember that exposure in and of itself is not a disability. So just, just saying I have qualifying service isn't enough. You do have to have a disability to attach to that presumptive condition that the PACT Act covers. Um, mm. but yeah, I mean, it opened up a lot for a lot of people. Um, opened up. In fact, Guam was one of the big ones um, for for uh, Agent Orange exposure. Right? Um, they actually dumped barrels of Agent Orange into the into the ocean around Guam. So it did it did have a great effect on those veterans that were serving there. But just make sure that you have one of those those presumptive conditions. Um, don't just file just because you were exposed. Make sure you have one. If you file just because you're exposed, it's going to get denied. Um, so make sure you have a diagnosed condition. Oh, what a great point. So, so y'all let's talk about presumptive real quick. And by the way, if you go to the Google machine or whatever search engine you use and you type V a presumptive list, we've got over 200 conditions listed. Some of them are not actually listed in the law because they go by different names. Go look. It's a comprehensive list broken out by the period of service and where you might have served. Okay. It's broken out in detail. Go look at that. The VA presumptive list. Let's talk about a presumptive. Okay. Presumptive service connection works a little bit different than the other types of service connection. Presumptive service connection is generally easier to prove. Okay. Because the nexus is presumed. What does that mean? And you heard Daryl talk about on your DD-214. If you served in an eligible location during a qualifying period, okay, the presumptive periods, that's going to be listed on your DD-214. Okay. So I'll give you an example. Okay. I'm an Afghan vet. I served in Afghanistan in 2011. 
I have a full detailed printout, like the air quality health report. It's it's bad. We were burning trash. We had an open poo pond at Kandahar Airfield. I mean, it was it was bad. I'm certain that somewhere down the line, I'm going to pay the price for that. Okay. I haven't yet, but I think it's coming. Knock on wood. Um, but what that means is on my DD-214, it shows that for this period, I was in Afghanistan for this period. Eligible location, qualifying service. But then you have to go back and look, do you have one of the presumptive conditions medically diagnosed? Okay, well, guess what? I was exposed to burn pits and open poo ponds in Afghanistan but I don't have a diagnosis for sinusitis, rhinitis, or rhinosinusitis, which are, are the three, I believe, main conditions. So guess what? If I went and filed a PACT Act claim for burn pit exposure, that's going to get denied. Why is it going to get denied? The raider has to deny it because they can't even verify that I've been medically diagnosed with one of those conditions, okay? So what DMAC is saying here, just because you had exposure doesn't mean that that exposure led to the development of a disability condition that you got diagnosed, which means you might be eligible for VA disability benefits. Those are two very different things. So if you're hearing my voice and you think you might have a presumptive condition, but it ain't yet diagnosed. You got to get your butt to the doctor because if that ain't diagnosed, it's going to get denied. Absolutely. Absolutely denied. And not only that, but now you're, you're on a, in all honesty, now you're, you're submitting a claim that's taken RVSR time has taken VSR time. And it has to be developed. It has to be rated. So now you've just kind of taken away from another veteran who uh, whose claim has been waiting. So, yeah, I can't stress that enough. Make sure you have a, a diagnosed condition before you submit a claim for any of that stuff. Yeah, here, here's a here's a great lesson that just came to me. Don't be submitting crap claims, y'all. <laughs> submit a submit a good claim. Submit a high quality claim. OK, with medical evidence. With nexus evidence, get a nexus letter if you've been out of the service for more than a year, okay? If you need to, to document symptomatology or what you're dealing with, write a personal statement. Explain to the raider they're people just like us, just like you. Many of them are veterans. Tell them, I was in Afghanistan. We had a lot of indirect fire. I feared for my life. Here's what happened. Here's my symptoms now. Insomnia, anger sexual dysfunction. I can't think brain fog. I'm stressed all the time. I don't sleep for crap. My relationships suck. I don't have any friends. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a drug addict. Write down what's going on with you. Because guess what? The Raider's a person. The Raider probably has the same crap going on that you're dealing with. Okay. In fact, if you write a good personal statement, that Raider's probably going to go, man, this is good stuff. I'm going to use this on my own claim. <laughs> okay? But I'm telling y'all, you have to tell your true story. Okay. Not anybody else's, your story. Everybody's disability situation is a little bit different. Okay. Tell your story, not somebody else's. Okay. Final thoughts before we wrap up our first episode of Ask the VA Raider with veteran coach DMAC, Daryl McDonald. What do you think, buddy? Any parting thoughts? Um, you know what? Just if you're going to submit a claim, make sure your claim is a complete claim. Do the, the fully, um, fully developed claim process. It moves it so much quicker. Stick to one or two issues. And if you're not service connected, if you're not service connected for anything, Look for those gateway claims, those claims that are at least going to get you in the system may not equate to a, a big 100% right off the bat, but it's going to get you in the system It's going to get you moving, looking for secondaries. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, what a blessing. Again, this is our first episode of Ask the VA Raider, but we're going to be doing more of these. So please like, comment, 
share, tell us what you think. If you want to do us to do more of these, please let us know. Thanks y'all. Thanks DMAC. Thank you.